Guess the gang's all here, huh? Seven o'clock. I'm sure we're going to get a buzz here in a couple seconds. Um, we're going to be continuing in the book of Second Peter. We started this on this uh, past Sunday morning. Uh, but before we get started, um, Ricky, can you lead us in a word of prayer? Now we pray. The Father in heaven, we are thankful for this midweek, Father. We thank you for allowing us to come here study another portion of your word and help us to understand what we hear. Continue to be with Cody as he teaches us, Father. Father, be with our teachers that teaches the children, Father. Continue to help them to uh, teach the children. Continue to help them to learn more about you. And Father, we thank you for watching over our sick. We thank you for allowing them to get well. Help them continue to be with us, Father. Father, be with those that are traveling at this time. Help them have a safe trip and bring back home safely. Father, we thank you. But though all things come to you, continue to keep us from harm. For we ask pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> um, so, again, this past Sunday morning, we started in the book of 2 Peter. Uh, 2 Peter is one of those books that is rarely read, rarely studied. Uh, usually, if someone has a knowledge of 2 Peter, it's only a, a few choice verses. Uh, but even then, those few cho uh, choice verses kind of do a, a pretty good job at explaining the book. There's, there's a thread that goes through the book. Um, Again, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll state some of the introduction stuff. Uh, when you look at, at this book, uh, we know that this is written to the same people which he wrote his first letter. You see that chapter 3 and verse 1, he says, Now this is the second time that I'm writing to you. Uh, so it's the same people, and that would be the churches in uh, Pontus, Asia, Bithynia. So just the Asia Minor area just in general. And uh, what we know about the Asia Minor area is that they faced different uh, <laughs> threats of apostasy. Uh, those came in the um, image of uh, Judaizing teaching, and as well as Gnosticism, which John is going to deal with in 1 John, which uh, we'll be studying after we finish 2 Peter. Um, when you look at, at 2 Peter, there's a lot of um, connections, I guess, that can be made between 1 and 2 Peter. And first and second Timothy, uh, you look at the style which is written. You look at the content uh, that that is given. You know, first Timothy was Paul's letter to to Timothy to fan the flame, um, uh, to and to encourage him and, and to prompt him to wage good warfare. See that first Timothy one eighteen and nineteen, as well as uh, first Timothy three and verse eight and uh, first Timothy six and verse twelve. And then uh, 2 Timothy was to encourage him to continue in the, sound, in the pattern of sound doctrine, 2 Timothy 1 and verse uh, 13. And you're seeing the same kind of format in First and Second Peter. First Peter was written to encourage the saints uh, as they were facing um, persecution, as they were uh, preparing themselves for persecution. This persecution would come, 1 Peter 1 and verses 6 and 7. It would test the genuineness of their faith. Um, something which even then Peter says is precious, and he's going to say again is precious in Second Peter. Uh, Second Peter is is encouraging them really to follow in sound doctrine, follow in the pattern, and you're going to see um, that one encouragement or one overarching encouragement, right, and then uh, two warnings, and, and that that breaks up very easily uh, into sections by uh, chapter chapter one. Uh, we said is a challenge to keep growing, a challenge to keep growing. Chapter two is a warning against false teachers uh, who are leading people astray by their corrupt living. And then chapter three is a warning against false teachers who are leading people astray by their corrupt theology. And so um, the, a lot of this book has to do with warning 
against false teachers. And so Peter, what he is, is trying to do in this letter is restore the confidence and the order of the church uh, in, in each of these congregations. Uh, and he's doing this while also addressing some of the accusations that were brought up against him and the apostles. Um, yeah. But, but how long after First Peter this was written? Um, it would be pretty shortly after because uh, First Peter is believed to have been written around the same time as uh, Mark, and Mark was written. Um, or rather, I take that back. First Peter is believed to have been written somewhere around 60 A.D. Uh, Second Peter somewhere around 64 A.D. They again, you look at Second Peter. This is coming off as uh, his farewell address. You can see that in verse 14. He knows he's going to die soon. He says, "I know the putting off of my body will be soon." Uh, so he's anticipating death to come fastly, and the uh, just what what's been accepted uh, historically and culturally is that uh, Peter Peter was killed in 64 AD under the reign of Nero. So this, this is pretty soon after. Um, it's not much late after. And also this is coming uh, what's believed to be soon after the, uh, the death of the Apostle Paul. And so you think about Paul. Paul wrote 2 Timothy as his farewell, as his encouragement to a young preacher to continue. And so now Peter, as he's soon... Uh, going to die he's writing to encourage uh, the saints in the congregations to to push forward and you know Peter is addressing uh, the Asia Minor area and what we what we know to be true because of letters like Colossians is that these letters would be circulated amongst them and so second Peter was likely circulated it's probably written because of the the, the broad addressing it's probably written in various um, various copies and each passed on and also circulated as well as you know Timothy's letters may have been recorded and circulated and um, the benefit of that is you know it, it covers all the bases because Peter is addressing the saints in Asia Minor and Paul's addressing the preachers in Asia Minor uh, Timothy namely and uh, you know Timothy was there in Ephesus Ephesus is there in Asia Minor so all of this is being brought out to encourage, um, encourage the church as a whole to, to stay as the church, uh, to stay as the bride of Christ, and to uh, keep their image. Um, chapter 1, uh, when you look at verses 1 through 11, uh, that's what we covered on Sunday morning. Verses 1 through 11, it was God's invitation to be participants in his divine nature. And uh, in that section, there's a lot of um, deep uh, statements, a lot of statements that come off a lot deeper than people uh, realize. For instance, whenever he introduces, uh, introduces himself as a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, he puts that, that word servant before apostle, showing his ultimate allegiance, and then apostle showing his authority. Um, verse... Um, Verse 1 hosts a, a, a precious uh, statement here. Uh, the, King, uh, the ESV says, uh, To those who obtained a faith of equal standing with ours. And the King James is going to say, A like precious faith. And that spoke to the equality uh, for Jews and Gentiles in Christ. And then we also talked about some of those things that make our faith precious. You have the blood of Christ, 1 Peter 1, verses 18 and 19. You have the people themselves that make up the church, 1 Peter 2 and verse 4, and then the Savior, 1 Peter 2 and verse 6. We're, we're participants in, in a great, uh, great thing. We, we share in a precious, precious faith. And that word precious, uh, you could put down as a key word, especially for chapter 1. Um, verse 3 uh, is, is a go-to. Uh, for many, uh, that he has given us all things pertaining to life and godliness. We know that we are uh, thoroughly equipped uh, by God. Uh, you get that from 2 Timothy 3, verses 16 and 17. Uh, we know that he has provided us a path uh, so that we could walk in his steps, Psalm 119 and verse 105. Uh, we know that he has given us the resource so that we could live a pure life and be pleasing to him, Psalm 119. Verses 9 and 11. Um, 
when going through this this section, another um, in verses one through eleven, another uh, group of verses that's often brought out, verses five through seven. Uh, these seven di different attributes that, that Peter says we're to be supplementing our faith with. And uh, you look here at verse 8, for if these qualities are yours and increasing. Uh, that means that you don't just work on these one time. You don't just work on these periodically. You don't just work on these as you see fit. You're working on these all the time. You're working constantly to be uh, a man or a woman of virtue, uh, of the excellence of behavior, um, to be one who knows the word of God, has that knowledge, uh, has self-control, that ability to fortify their hearts and their steadfastness, the ability to fortify your mind so that you don't let negativity corrupt your, your, uh, your godliness. Um, you're one who's striving constantly for godliness, to be in the image of Christ, to be in the image of God, to be imitators of him, as Paul said in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 1. Um, you're constantly longing uh, to obtain brotherly affection, uh, much like Peter said in 1 Peter 2 and verse 17, uh, to love the brotherhood. That's what we're striving for each and every day. Uh, aside from differences, aside from cultural differences, uh, personal differences, personality styles, all those different things, we're striving constantly uh, to love one another dearly. And, and ultimately, he finishes it with love, and that's that unconditional love, and that's a love for all individuals. That's a love for the sinner. Uh, that's a love for the saint. And uh, that's what we're constantly striving to have. And he says here in verse 9 that uh, those who don't have those qualities, they're blind. Uh, they, they, they are nearsighted. Uh, they have forgotten that they were cleansed from their former sins. That means they've grown apathetic. Uh, if you are someone who doesn't love your brothers or sisters in Christ, that means that that's a clear sign that you don't care about your faith. If you're someone who, who does not uh, study the scriptures to have a more perfect knowledge of his will for you and I, as well as his commandments, uh, you're, you're showing yourself to God as someone who just simply does not care. Uh, you're blinded. Uh, you've forgotten that you're cleansed. Um, however, verse 8, he says, if these are your qualities, if you do have these, you're not going to be ineffective. You're not going to be unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that word knowledge is um, the, the intimate knowledge and so he's saying here, you're striving to know God more perfectly so you can serve him more perfectly. Uh, you're not just going to be spinning your wheels, right? You're going to gain, uh, you're going to gain access to that. And you're going to know him better. Um, verses 10 and 11, you know, he encourages them to make their calling and election sure. Uh, Paul does that several times. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 1, he encourages them to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which they have been walked uh, and to which they have been called rather and uh, and, and so that's a, that's a constant uh, endeavor of the Christian is to constantly make it known to God that, that you are, are thankful for your salvation and to constantly strive to obtain the, the ultimate result of your salvation which you see in verse 11 he says for this uh, for in this way there will be richly provided to you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He says, if you endeavor to know him, if you make these qualities yours, if you supplement your faith daily, constantly with these things, you will get to heaven. You will be with him on the other side of eternity. You will be a partaker in the divine nature. That partaker of the divine nature means to be like him in eternity. And the only way you, you can do that is if you live a righteous life. The only way to be like him on the other side of eternity is to be counted by him as a righteous servant. Um, you look here at verses uh, 12 through 15. This is where we left off. We're beginning here in verse 12. Uh, verses 12 through 15, you have the letter's purpose. Uh, it's pretty simple. Peter, uh, Peter is pretty simple. He puts things out there uh, very bluntly, very honestly. And um, 
He says here, therefore, I intend to remind you of these qualities, though you have them and are established in the truth that you have. I think it is right, as long as I am in the body, to stir you up by way of reminder, since I know that the putting off of my body will be soon, as our Lord Jesus Christ made clear to me. Verse 15, And I will make every effort so that after my departure you may be able at any time to recall these things. So his purpose, number one, is to remind the Christian. Verses 12 through 14. He says, therefore, I intend to remind you always of these things. That is constantly, constantly reinforcing these qualities in his teaching. And he's doing this because they're important. He is saying that these qualities are essential for salvation. These qualities are essential to have a home with God. Did Christ go and, and, and is he currently preparing a place for us? Yes, he tells us that in John 14. But the only way you had these qualities, the only way you get to that place, the only way that whenever the bridegroom comes back, you go with him, uh, is if you have these qualities. Um, and the question is begged. You know, a lot of people, they, they get upset because uh, there's too much teaching on a certain subject. Is there too much teaching? Can there be too much teaching on basic Christian fundamentals? No. no. I mean, you look at these virtuous things here. These are basic Christian fundamentals. Be wow. virtuous. Be a good person. That, that's literally what that means. Be a good person. Uh, could there be too much teaching on having knowledge, studying your Bible, reading your Bible daily, trying to put it in your mind? We know that if it's in your mind, you can't overcome temptation. You see that in Psalm 119 and verse 11, your word I have stored up in my heart that I might not sin against you. Uh, Ephesians 6 and verses, uh, verses 10 through 12, Paul says, uh, you are the army of God and you need to equip yourself in a certain way so that you can overcome the temptations, the, the darts, the arrows of Satan. And to do that, you're supposed to equip yourself, Ephesians 6 and verse 17, with the word of God, with the word of God, the sword of the spirit. Uh, you look at Matthew chapter four, when Jesus was tempted, he provided us the example of how you overcome temptation. You overcome temptation with scripture. There's no way to overcome temptation in a worldly manner. Worldliness does not overcome temptation. Godliness does. And the only way to become godly, the only way to fortify yourself in a godly manner is to fortify yourself in the word. So there's not too much teaching that could be done on, on things like this. Uh, what we ought to do is we ought to make it our duty. Uh, the more I think about it, I was thinking about it last night. Uh, especially as you know, you're watching election uh, trends right now, the way different states are voting, the way that different age demographics are, are voting. And you think about, uh, I mean, you just look at the popular vote right now. The popular vote is slanted towards uh, Biden, right? And uh, you, you think about what percentage of America, what percentage of the voters make up the denominations it's estimated that 70 out of every 100 citizens in the United States is a member of a Christian denomination, a Christian group of some sort. And so it just makes you think about the importance of teaching doctrinal things, the importance of constantly reinforcing moral issues. If you're constantly reinforcing moral issues, then something like a, the Democrat platform, which teaches uh, that life is nothing and that life can be easily expanded, uh, that doesn't thrive whenever moral principles are clearly being taught. But the problem is that there's so many people around my age group and a little bit older and even younger who have no grasp of moral issues. And that's not just a, a problem amongst the denomination, that's a problem in the church. It's a problem in the church. I was sitting down yesterday with, uh, actually not yesterday, today, sorry, I took a nap, so yesterday comes this morning. Uh, I was sitting down with Logan this morning and I was telling him about something that someone who is my peer wrote. My peer 
said that they think abortion is a sin, but that it should be 100% legal. My peer said that they believe homosexuality is a sin, but it should be 100% legal. My peer said that he believes that fornication, adultery is a sin, but abortion should be an acceptable uh, way of, of, of uh, escaping the consequences of that sin, that plan B's should be a, a, a reasonable way of escaping those sort of, um, the, the, the sort of um, repercussions that come with those sins. And, and so you look at it, that, that's a member of the church. That's a member of the church whose father was a gospel preacher. And that's not just one individual. That, that, that guy, I'm using him as an example, to represent a good amount of Christians, of young Christians uh, today. And uh, it's shameful. I believe the reason why is because we have not spent enough time looking at topics like what it means to be virtuous, what it means to have knowledge, what it means to have self-control, what it means to, to be steadfast, what it means to be godly. I mean, think about what does that mean to be godly? That means you're opposed to every single uh, one of those moral issues that the Democrat says you need to be in line with them about. You're opposed to abortion. You're opposed to alcoholism. You're opposed to the legalization of drugs. You're opposed to all those different things when you're godly. Um, and so, I mean, you just think about where we're at in the church today, what needs to be taught the first principles need to be taught. Those need to be reinforced strongly. Um, verse 15, he speaks about his purpose again. His purpose is now to equip. So in verses 12 through 14, he says, I'm here to remind you. I want to remind you of these things. I'm going to constantly remind you of these things. Don't think you're going to sit down and talk with me without me reminding you of this. And I'm doing this to equip you. He says he is making every effort. In our teaching, we need to be making every effort to reinforce godly characteristics so that the saints can go home. And when I say go home, I mean be with the Father. That's the ultimate goal that each and every one of us has. That's what we are striving for. That's what we desire uh, strongly. And the only way we get there is if we equip ourselves with these qualities. Um, you look here in our third section, verses 16 through 21, Peter is addressing one of the accusations that's made against him and the rest of the apostles. The, the accusation becomes apparent uh, in verse 16. He says, for we did not uh, follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. The accusation Peter and the rest of the apostles are making everything up. Peter and the rest of the apostles are speaking according to their own imagination. And that definitely seems to me like something that uh, the Judaizing teachers would have been saying. Uh, and that definitely seems to me like something that the Gnostics would have been saying. You know, the Gnostics, the main premise behind Gnostic belief is I have received special revelation of a special knowledge that can only be given to you in a special way. Uh, that goes against everything. That goes against 2 Peter 1 verse 3. God has given us all things pertaining to life and godliness. There's no special revelation. There's no special knowledge. He's given us all things. And uh, so you look here at verses 16 through 18. You have the accusation. And also in that you have Peter's testimony. He says in verse 17. He said, so in verse 16, the accusation again. You're making it up. Okay, you think I'm making it up? Listen to what I have to say. Verse 17 and 18. For when we received honor and glory from God the Father, and the honor and glory from God the Father, that was the apostleship. They were made Christ's apostles. God chose them. The Father chose them. And the voice was born to him by the majestic glory. This is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves... We ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven, and we were with him on the holy mountain. What is Peter's testimony? 
is at the transfiguration. He uses the transfiguration as an answer to the accusation. He says, we were there with Christ. We were there when God told us, you teach what the son tells you to teach. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. Uh, God is pointing them directly to Christ. You listen to what Christ is. The words of Christ are our judge. John 12 verses 48 and 50. And the words of Christ are righteousness. Uh, and so Peter, he's saying here, I've been told by God the Father this. I was there. I heard his voice. He spoke to me clearly. And so now I'm doing it. I am teaching as, as, as God would have me to do. These are... Uh, what, what he's talking about here, what he does, what he's teaching is not the works of men. Uh, obviously, you can tell it's not the works of men because it's stepping on people's toes. People aren't liking it. People are turning into something else. These aren't the works of men, but they're the work of God. And so in verses 19 through 21, Peter is going to talk about his inspiration. You'll hear in verse 19, And we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed, to which you will do well. To pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of men. But men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Uh, he's saying here that the words which he speak, uh, which he speaks are the words of God. First Peter 4 and verse 11 if any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. Uh, just as God influenced the, the words of the prophets of old, Peter is saying he influences the words of the apostles in that time. As he was speaking, he was speaking according to the oracles of God. It wasn't the idea that the Catholics came up with that he could bind and loose as he so chose, but he spoke about what was bound and he spoke about what was loose. Um, he did not come up with his own his own things, but he spoke as the Holy Spirit led him. And so that transitions us uh, interestingly in the chapter two. A lot of times uh, we do ourselves a disservice in looking at chapters one and two uh, separate. But you look here at chapter two. Uh, chapter two, you could title this as keep faith. So chapter one, keep growing. Chapter two, keep faith. And in verses one through three, he's telling us to watch out for false teachers uh, he says here in verse 1, uh, But false teachers also arose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you, who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who, who bought them, bringing upon themselves swift destruction. Uh, look at this. So verses uh, 20 and 21, he talks about inspiration. Peter talks about inspiration. Chapter 1, verses 20 and 21. He says, holy men speak as they are led by the Holy Spirit. Chapter 2 and verse 1, but false prophets arise. And just as I'm speaking by inspiration, false teachers have risen. They are among you. They are bringing in destructive heresies. And they're doing it secretly. And that is only going to lead them to a swift destruction. Uh, you think about verse 1. In verse 1, you could you could break it up. Um, verses 1 through 3, again, is that exhortation to watch for false teachers. And the reason why, I think 1, 2, and 3 provide us three different reasons. Reason 1 is found in verse 1, and that's because they are a present threat. They are a present threat. Uh, you look at that, that phrase, but, all, but false prophets also arose among the people. He's saying in the same way as there are holy men who speak, carried by the Holy Spirit, there will be those who spoke, uh, those who were there who spoke, claiming to be led by the Spirit, but were lying. Um, and, and he uses that comparison between prophets and teachers in the first century. Can you think of an example in Scripture of where you had holy men speaking as led by the Spirit, and they had a contest, or they had a... Uh, Disagreement or contention between false prophets. You have Elijah and the prophets of Baal, right? Those prophets of Baal were Israelites. Those prophets of Baal were Israelites. So you had Elijah versus those many. And uh, 
you know, the people of Israel were making their decision based upon that. That's why Elijah says, you know, how long will you go limping? If God, if, if uh, the Lord is God, then serve him. If Baal is God, then serve him. But let's make it clear now. The Lord is God. And so they go through their contest. Another example would be uh, Jeremiah and the false prophets. In Jeremiah chapter 6, you, you find out that the false prophets are going and teaching that there is peace when there is no peace. And Jeremiah is teaching that there is destruction coming because you're at ease. Uh, there's destruction coming because you have lost sight of the faith. You, ha you have lost uh, your spiritual senses. Uh, another example is Ezekiel in Ezekiel chapter 13. Um, I'm going to turn there. Ezekiel chapter 13. I believe it's verses 3 and 4. I found this uh, pretty interesting. Ezekiel 13 verses 3 and 4. Let's look at it. I'll, I'll, I'll read verses 1 through 4. The word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, prophesy against the prophets of Israel who are prophesying and say to those who prophesy. Notice how God puts it here. From their own hearts. Hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God. Woe to the foolish prophets who follow their own spirit and have seen nothing. Your prophets have been like jackals among ruins. O Israel. I find it very interesting how God phrases that. Those who prophesy from their own hearts. Uh, you look at the true prophets of God. Again, first, or 2 Peter 1, 20 and 21. They speak according to the Spirit. They're led by the Spirit. You look at the false prophet, the false teacher. They're led by their own hearts, their own desires. Um, and you're going to see that in verse 3. Also, um, what's interesting here is he says, uh, Woe to the foolish prophets who follow their own spirit and have seen nothing. Have seen nothing. Uh, when you look here in uh, 2 Peter chapter 2, there is a, a description that Peter gives of the false teacher. Um, verse... Verse 14, they have eyes full of adultery, insatiable for sin. They entice unsteady souls. They have hearts trained in greed, accursed children. Uh, so you look, at, you look at the false teacher. Uh, Peter says they have eyes full of adultery. They're blinded by sin. Uh, and, and you think about that in comparison to what he said in verse 9, chapter 1 and verse 9, that whoever lacks these qualities, whoever lacks these basic principles of the faith, they're blind. They're so nearsighted that they can't see. The false prophet was so nearsighted that they can't see. The false teacher is so nearsighted that they can't see. Nearsighted in the, in the sense that I, I get it, that they are looking at themselves and they can only look at themselves. They can only see this far. What does Cody want? What do I want? They can't see beyond that. You think about those who serve God accurately, those who serve God well. It talks about Moses in Hebrews chapter 11, who served the excellent one who he could not see. The Hebrews writer makes a distinction. He could not see them. And that is to, 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 uh, to not entice us, but to prompt us to live by faith. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 7. We walk by faith, not by sight. We're not looking at the immediate results. We're not looking at, at who I see first. We're looking beyond that. Who do I serve? Where does that service lead me? Uh, you look here in, in verse 1. Uh, he says, Just as there will be false teachers among you, there is a present falsehood amongst the people. And it's expected for that to be the case. Is that God's intention? No, but it's expected. It's expected in the same on the same basis that there is to be dark uh, contrast to light um, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, when you think about this, these false teachers being among them, does the um, New Testament address false teaching often? 
just about every single New Testament book, you're going to find an addressing towards false doctrine and uh, behavior that does not correspond with obedient uh, obedience to true doctrine. Every epistle has doctrinal details so that people know how they ought to behave. Every personal exchange um, has warnings of falsehood in Scripture. Every, uh, every book, even the book of Acts, the book of Acts is called the Acts of the Apostles. And it's called that so that the readers can look and say, this is how we act. This is how we walk according to true doctrine. This is how we do it well. Um, Yeah. And, and they're not going to know what they're doing. Right. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's uh, you know, um, it's the same basis in which, uh, you know, Paul spoke to the Ephesian elders in Acts chapter 20. He said that there are going to be wolves that come among you. Uh, talking about the eldership there is going to become twisted. Um, and obviously that's not something that comes announced. No one comes in and says, Hey, by the way, I'm going to start teaching uh, instrumental music. I hope you're okay with that. Oh, hey, by the way, I'm going to start teaching so on and so forth, and I hope you're okay with that. Nobody does that. They come in, they introduce it little by little by little. That's why he says here uh, that they will bring, uh, that they will secretly bring destructive heresies. They work secretly. They work as sheep and wool or wolves in sheep's clothing. Uh, Matthew 7 verse 16. You can't come and collect and collect the sheep if you're not dressed like the shepherd, right? You can't come if you don't have the appearance of holiness and, and teach these people. And when you look at these these uh, twist offs from doctrine, you, you look at these departures, they're often presented as a new idea or a new revelation. A new idea or a new revelation. Um <clears throat> uh, when, keep when, up with the times. Yeah, keep it up with the times. Just like Jeroboam did in First Kings 12. He told them, y'all worship this way long enough. Let's worship this way. Let's see how this works for you. Um, <clears throat> when we're talking here about these, uh, these false teachers again, uh, two, two of the greater possibilities for these uh, false doctrines would be Gnosticism and Judeo-Christianity. Judeo-Christianity, Paul refutes in the book of Galatians, the book of Colossians, and um, also the Hebrew writer refutes Judeo-Christianity, and then also Gnosticism is refuted uh, in, in 1 John. Um, what's interesting here is that it, it, whenever uh, Peter is talking about false teaching, he says that it is a denial of the master who bought them. Um, you turn away from doctrine, you turn away from God. You can't follow God without doctrine. I've seen a lot of people who have been making statements like relationship over religion. They say you can follow God according to whatever religion so long as you have that relationship with him. Last I checked, John 14, verse 15, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. That's obedience. If you love me, you're going to follow the doctrine. Um, another interesting thing about that phrase, they deny the Lord that bought them, is uh, you, you think about how false teachers come in, how they get a grasp. They don't get a grasp by looking like awful people, right? I mean, do people listen to, let's say, Joel Osteen because they think that he's Satan? No, because they look at him and they say, he's a good guy. He has the appearance of, of being saved, but he's not. He has the appearance, though, and that, that's what gets people... Uh, people's attention. And then you look here what he says, uh, closing verse 1, uh, bringing upon themselves swift destruction. What do they receive? Swift destruction. Psalm 1, the, the image that's given there is like the chaff being blown away into the fire, right? That's swift, swift destruction. I uh, guess we're going to get the bell. So we're going to pick up in verse 2 next Wednesday.